Alafia, I'm Dr. Gloria Lattimore, Peace, host and producer of OmniU Presents, the H3O Art of Life show, and am I a happy camper today? Let me tell you one thing, you are just in for such a treat that I couldn't imagine that we could have such a treat, but we are here today to do exactly that. The title of this show is Imagine That, Imagination and Creativity, and we have with us some of the most imaginative, imaginary people. And I do mean imaginary because when I spoke to one of my guests and said I knew who he was, Oscar Brown Jr. said he didn't even know who he was. <laughs> so I imagine that means he is imaginary. But they are really real and you're going to get a, a taste of what they do after we have a little chat. But right now I just want to introduce my guest and I think I'll start with the one with the hard name, the one whose name is Teju. Teju, how are you today? Fine, thank you. Say thank all you. of your name for our guests. Uh, Teju Mola Ologoni. I love it. What name does this come from? Uh, my great-great-grandfather's from Nigeria, and that was his name. It okay. means the protector of the family's honor and a priest in the society that worships the earth goddess. So that was the origin of the name. Yeah. Wonderful. Mm. So, but everybody just says Teju. Okay, well, after a while, I'm going to say more than that. But okay. right now, I'm going to say Teju <laughs> and greet you. Thank you. Thank and you. And Andrea Fain, how are you? Fine, thank you. How are you? Very good. And your voice is all right? Well, great. Okay, <laughs> well, Andrea was concerned that her voice might be giving her a little challenge. But I think that when she gets through having all this fun, her voice is going to find its way right out, right over that microphone. Okay, I'm looking forward to it. Me too. Oscar Brown Jr., give an account of yourself. I see you all over the place. I saw you on Deaf Poetry Jam. I just had my 76th birthday day before oh. yesterday. Uh -huh. Really? You a yeah. Libra? Yep. Oh, my. I am, too. And that's about, that sums it up. That, <laughs> but you know what? You have given me new faith. What's because that? there are so many people who are really falling victim to Alzheimer's and dementia of various kinds. And Oscar Brown Jr. remembers everything. I mean, he not only remembers all the stories and all the characters and all the skits, but he also remembers all the songs and all the people. And, you know, I knew him when I was younger, and so I don't know what all he remembers, but I think he may remember that too. But I'm glad to know that uh, there are people who are 76 years old who can remember things. Aren't you glad to, that you have such a good memory? What do you attribute it to? <laughs> well, <laughs> I have to get your mind. It's certainly not clean living. <laughs> 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 my daughter sent me a card to that effect for my birthday. <laughs> she said, Another year, and you're still in good shape. This says, uh, you know, that reveals things about good living. <laughs> <laughs> that's not exactly it, but that's what it amounted to. Okay. So you just inherited this incredible memory. Yeah, I don't know how I came by that. Okay. You know, that was just, um, there's no school that I know to attend mm -hmm. that would teach you how to remember. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it just sort of came with the territory uh, as far as excellent. poet, writing, singing. Right. Mm. Well, you know, that's an African attribute to remember. You know, I mean, it's very sacred and, and it's expected. It is not expected that you will forget. And so to remember is to remember, to put back together those elements of your experience mm. that may be scattered over time. Mm -hmm. And I'm just happy to know that we have these good people here today who remember their roots mm -hmm. and who are, you're looking so beautiful. I love it. I love it. Tony Brown. Yes. I was so happy to talk to you over the phone because you have this wonderful voice. Mm -hmm. I was so glad to meet you when I finally did. Mm -hmm. Tell me about this organization. Well, your, your favorite, favorite storytellers, storytellers Foundation is an organization that's designed to bring back the oral tradition, to be able to spread it across diaspora. You know, uh -huh. it's so important to know that we have something special and we need to express it, not hold it in. Well, that's a good reason to do some good work. Yes. And then you're having fun. Oh, having a ball. I know. And you've done a lot of things around the Chicagoland area. Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, last month we brought 10 men here from all over the country, all storytellers, and it was phenomenal. What do you expect to do next? We're going to do the Women of Storytelling next year. 
next in Chicago? In Chicago. We're bringing oh, 10 women wonderful. here from all over the country. Well, one of the women be Kucha. Yes, indeed. Kucha Brownlee, your wife. Yes. And I was so surprised to find out I knew you from before. <laughs> How are you? Before Fantastic. what? Before today. <laughs> <laughs> you know he's a troublemaker. <laughs> <laughs> we have to be careful. That's what Ashcroft said. Don't ask questions. <laughs> okay. Seems to me I remember you in relationship to a ritual having to do with the Yoruba. Is that tr right or yes. is that wrong? You know, I've, I've been performing around Chicago for a long time. I performed with the Cultural Messengers and I okay. performed... Uh, I remember that. Uh huh. Okay. I know, and and I performed with um, Panama, okay. the vocal group, and as well as uh, storytelling with Ashe, the okay. Chicago Association All of Black right. Storytellers, and uh, I I know that you did a libation ceremony. Uh, I saw you do that once with uh, I don't remember exactly. Show. It was it was a as part of a. A Kwanzaa celebration, oh, so long. I God. think. That's been a while ago. Well, see, <laughs> I try to remember things, too. <laughs> but you know what they say, one of the hallmarks of Alzheimer's is you remember things for a, a, a very long time ago, but you can't remember what you just said in the last <laughs> second. <laughs> so I don't know whether or not to attribute my ability to remember this, what I just remember, to anything in particular. Now, let's just talk freely for a little bit before we start. Somebody talk to me about what the storytelling, what effect the storytelling has on our community. Does it do us good to be creative and to express ourselves? Does it inspire us? What is the value of storytelling? I just attended the performance that Ashe had at the Duncan YMCA. And uh, it did a lot of people a lot of good. People just enjoyed themselves. Mm -hmm. There was a great variety of stories told, and all of them were told well. Although I understand that some of the people had never presented their stories publicly before. Mm -hmm. It was seamless. I couldn't tell who was a vet and who wasn't. Mm -hmm. It was excellent. Mm -hmm. yes. Does it help us to convey a part of our history? Well, the thing is, I think that there was a time when it was denied by people of European descent that we had a history. Mm -hmm. And the only place where we preserved our history was in the oral tradition. Mm -hmm. It was passed on and passed down the line. And a lot of people think, well, um, Africans, people in Africa had an oral tradition because they couldn't write. Well, it's not true that they couldn't write, but there were just certain things they wanted to make sure had the immediacy of speaking it because when you speak it it's alive in front of the person that you're talking to and uh, it is really uh, what has saved the part of our heritage that we understand and not only just the heritage but the history I mean, most of the things that we know about from the 40s and 50s came from people telling us I mean people my age you know who was mm -hmm. born around that time mm -hmm. people telling us it wasn't in books you know Mm -hmm. And uh, finally, later on, they began to put it in books, but the oral tradition and storytelling really has uh, kept us in touch with what we are and who we are. Well, you know, I think that um, it, would, it just would be a remiss of me not to point out the fact that Africans invented the first form of writing. Yes, that's So true. it would be ridiculous for anybody to say that we have an oral tradition because we couldn't write, because no one else would be able to write if we had not codified a system of mm -hmm. writing so that the rest of the people who wanted to write could write. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's just so much. One of the things I want to point out, uh, and you probably already know it, but I want to do it for the benefit of the audience. There's a book called TV, The Plug-In Drug. It's by Marie Wynn. Mm -hmm. And she points out that television creates a situation in which the faculty of imaging cannot develop properly. Mm -hmm. And so that because television has the dimensions that it has that radio didn't have, of course, and that is the dimension that is visual, it prevents children from learning how to see with the mind's eye those things that are being heard with the ear, which, which results in children not being able to develop empathy and compassion because they are not actually able to project themselves into other experiences to see themselves in the place 
of the person who is having the experience. So it's very important to me that we have some means of developing the faculty of imaging so that children will be able to see the consequences of their behavior because they can imagine the consequences before the behavior takes place. So I think that this storytelling and the oral tradition has a very great value because it develops the faculty of attending. Just being able to pay attention is very valuable. And in fact, it, to, be, to not be able to pay attention is very dangerous. If one has no awareness, especially in a society where one may be under siege and you're walking around like a zombie, you know, not unaware of everything going on around you, you could very easily be taken out of here just because you are unaware. So the, what you're doing has implications for me as an educator far beyond just the entertainment value. Well, I think, too, it allows children, young people, to have a creative outlet, mm -hmm. you know, uh, to tell stories. Mm -hmm. Children are going to tell stories anyhow. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a certain time that um, there's like a little confusion between what is really a story and what really is. I mm -hmm. say two or three years old. Mm -hmm. Got a couple of grandchildren that age, and when he says he didn't break it, Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, it's for real for him that he didn't break it, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, too, that uh, that kind of, like, creative outlet, we learn the difference between what is and what isn't. Mm -hmm. But sometimes that has a tendency to get stifled in a purely literary world. Mm -hmm. And in uh, storytelling for children allows them to, like, you know, just make up things on the fly, just mm -hmm. to, you know, to keep all that alive. Mm -hmm. I know... Uh, uh, one of my major influences, and I say this all the time, was Oscar Brown Jr. Uh, when I was a street kid, and uh, we would just stand on the corner trying to remember, like, all the words from his album. And, mm -hmm. and then, like, just make up stuff in that same style, mm -hmm. the Oscar Brown Jr. style. And that was like, and we just do that all day and all night. And it kind of, like, gave us an outlet for being poor street kids where, you know, you could imagine this and imagine that. And mm -hmm. it's a, a safer outlet. I, mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know I had a style. <laughs> I mean, at that, at, certainly not at the mm -hmm. time you're mm -hmm. talking about. Oh, yeah, but right. it was a style. Our style kind of developed from kids used to tell each other the picture. If they went to the movies and you hadn't seen the movie, they would tell you the entire story mm -hmm. of the movie mm -hmm. with action. Right, and, <laughs> and the sound and effects. Out of <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. I also find that storytelling at as, as a foundation has imagination crust right in it. Mm -hmm. It just touches the imagination so mm -hmm. to be able to open the imagination and it just because today too many things block it. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're, we're almost typhoned. You can't just express and be open. Mm -hmm. but you, you might even say that we do too much feeling with, with, with not enough feeling with our heart mm -hmm. and thinking with our heart. Mm -hmm. We're always coming from the head where mm -hmm. it's heading everything mm -hmm. instead of hearting it. Mm -hmm. To me, it's the balance of both, mm -hmm. so they can really see the whole picture. And although we may have created the first writing today, we cannot uh, be sure our children are going to get everything we want them to know from a book. Mm -hmm. So if, we, if it's spoken to them, and it, they will get it faster and pass it on. Mm -hmm. So that's what I find is uh, that when children start listening to stories. Mm -hmm. They get excited about wanting to tell some stories themselves. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if they, the realization that there are stories in books too will make them want to read. Mm -hmm. But also they get curious about talking to the, those elders around and seeing what kind of stories. I always say, well, you ever ask your grandmother? Somebody in your family tells the stories think about it mm -hmm. and then they come back mm -hmm. to me and they say oh, I got a story from you mm -hmm. for you mm -hmm. you know so you know this thing about telling stories I th when I think about the Dick and Jane reader mm -hmm. you know what child could be inspired to want to read that you mm -hmm. know how could you just not be able to wait until you could get to turn the page and see run Dick run jump <laughs> Sally jump 
But if children had, and I, I've had this experience because I taught my little grandson to read when he was probably not yet four. But I taught him to read by telling him the story of George Washington Carver from a book that was a primary book with pictures. And he would look, and I, I'd turn the pages, and I'd tell him the stories. And he started figuring out what was on those pages, and he was actually remembering. And so finally, he was able to remember the story and to turn the pages in the right place. And he did that until he was actually reading, because he picked up on the relationship between the words, the letters, mm -hmm. and the images that he saw. So if children had something that they really enjoyed reading, that they really could anticipate something going on there, they would themselves help themselves to read. Mm -hmm. But how can you expect children to want to read the rubbish that is well, in the primary readers there you go. When, they, when, when, when they're given them? And then stuff that has nothing to do with where they're living, what they're doing, what they eat, how they think, what their mother says, what their grandmama said, what Uncle Junebug said, what Cousin Peaches says. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it, it, it's just not mm -hmm. fresh for them. And it's I, not interesting. It's not fun. I think storytelling also allows uh, adults who tell stories uh, to keep imaginary playmates. Like, mm -hmm. you know, we were little kids. We had a little mm -hmm. imaginary playmates. Mm -hmm. You know, you have mm -hmm. tea with or uh -huh. fight with or something like that. And I think grown-up storytellers keep them. You know, I think because you when you don't tell, want to grow up for real. <laughs> well, <laughs> Peter Pan, <laughs> <laughs> never, never land. <laughs> no, but I mean, you know, most storytellers that I know, there's all, there's always, uh, you know, a hundred or so characters mm -hmm. in their head, and then going from character to character, they actually, um, and this is very much true for one of the greatest that I know, and I keep pumping him up because that's my guy, Oscar Brown Jr. Oh my! Is that when he assumes a character? Uh, another person talking, mm -hmm. it's totally that character. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you know what I'm saying? When he's a different person talking, and I think that's part of uh, the joy of it, is mm -hmm. that, you know, we can do that without mm -hmm. being labeled too crazy. Mm -hmm. You know, there's somebody yeah. standing on a corner doing that, they'll say, oh, well, let's, you know, mm -hmm. give him some My kind of drugs. My background is as a radio actor. Mm -hmm. I started when I was 15 years old acting in radio. Mm -hmm. When uh, before the Blue Network, I mean, before ABC became ABC, it was called the Blue Network. Mm -hmm. And I was on a program. Uh, Studs Circle was the star of that mm -hmm. show. And then later, Dick Durham mm -hmm. uh, wrote a series called Democracy USA, and that. Uh, evolved into de uh, destination freedom, mm -hmm. and I would be able to get work mm -hmm. playing different characters. Mm -hmm. uh, I would, I could play a little kid, or I could play a heavy or an old man, or something like that. And uh, so that got me <laughs> a lot of gigs. Well, you know, mm -hmm. we don't want to pretend like this is the Brown collage, but <laughs> when I was in grammar school, I was at Bullard School, mm. and Willard, at Willard School, we had teachers who made us very proud of our history, mm -hmm. sent us over to the Hall Branch Library mm -hmm. under Charlemagne Rollins mm -hmm. to get more proud. Mm -hmm. And we learned to love Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Mm -hmm. Vivian Harsh. Yes. Yeah. And mm -hmm. guess what? When Oscar Brown performed Paul Lawrence Dunbar, it turned me out. I just, you know, it was just, it was just such a pleasure because so many times as you go further up in academia they want to take away what is your native speech your mother tongue the language that you've grown up with to make you feel that you should be ashamed and to make you feel that you should give it up in favor of standard english mm -hmm. and paul Ars dunbar preserved our language mm -hmm. and oscar brown legitimized what Paul Lawrence Dunbar had done in my generation because Paul Lawrence Dunbar of course had written before mm -hmm. I was born so again to have credible people to legitimize that which is a rich part of your heritage then gives you permission to put your hands on your hip and say what black dialect mm -hmm. What are you talking about mm -hmm. you know well, speaking of hip one of the hip things I did was turn Phil Coran on to Paul Lawrence Dunbar. And he does Bill was him here too. For the, for the last time I was on your program, we right. shared the mm -hmm. stage. He um, wrote music mm -hmm. to Dunbar. Mm -hmm. And then we took that music around to, took that show mm -hmm. around to uh, public schools, mm -hmm. wound up over to the Museum of Science and Industry.
Mm -hmm. And it was such an excellent show, they never did it again. <laughs> <laughs> success. Success. Yes. Yes. Nothing yeah. succeeds like success. Well, mm -hmm. This concept like of success. leading with the head mm -hmm. instead of with the heart, you know, the comedic people, the Egyptians, mm -hmm. have the concept heart-mind. Mm -hmm. Don't separate the head from the heart. How right. can you? You know, and it is only in the European experience that you see people making a choice between whether or not you should employ your heart or your head in the making of a decision. I necessarily see, I, I, I came up with a word I call psychophysique. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I'm thinking about your whole person because mm -hmm. you're psychological and you mm -hmm. got a physique. Mm -hmm. And they try to separate the two, but if I step on your toe, that's all you'll think about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you got another concept. <laughs> yeah. So you say the whole person is engaged. Yeah, I don't see how you can separate the okay. mind from, from the body. Okay. And that's what the beauty of, of, of doing storytelling is that holistic approach. Mm -hmm. To me, there, there's a saying that you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink mm -hmm. it. But you can put salt in their oaks mm -hmm. and make them thirsty. Mm -hmm. well, to <laughs> we well, to go. me, storytelling is, is that salt mm -hmm. that our people desperately need mm -hmm. to touch them inside, spirit, because it's the whole person. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we keep thinking that it's just the physical, mm -hmm. but it's the whole person. Mm -hmm. Inside through, which is that spirit that just, you know, you hear another storyteller and you're like, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it just mm -hmm. moves you inside. Mm -hmm. You hear the drums play, you're a shakere. It's like, all of a sudden you start moving, because mm -hmm. that's our rhythm. It's in there. Mm -hmm. When I was at Willie, I was in the seventh grade, I had a teacher named Miss Stack. I didn't have uh, that. A white lady, long, long. Uh -huh. And she would let me tell stories on Friday for about 10 minutes, I just come up with an impromptu story mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and you know, regale the classroom mm -hmm. with it. Mm -hmm. I don't know how I got that. I, I didn't bribe her. Mm -hmm. And I had no history for it, but somehow she let me do that. Mm -hmm. I want you to tell stories, but I just have to ask one more question. And that's about this, this comedy um, that is so profane. I think that these stand-up comedians are they are part of the lineage, you know, the griot in Africa, the poet, mm -hmm. the orator. They, they belong in the lineage. What has gone astray with the message? You What's know, I, happening here? I think that we have to be careful about trying to judge what we do here in that sense through European Victorian moralistic standards. <laughs> you see, because mm. the fact of the matter is that there's no such thing as a profane word. You know, it's just in some societies, this word is not something that you're supposed to say. Mm -hmm. Okay? There are certainly profane acts and obscene acts. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you know, like bombing somebody. Mm -hmm. Now that's obscene and profane. Mm -hmm. You know, but I think we have to be careful in thinking that, um, you know, in looking at it uh, from another culture's view in terms of evaluating ourselves. There are certainly times and places where everything should be done, and now in, in the United States, it's like blown all over. You can hear anything, anywhere, anytime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that in terms of those uh, poets and um, um, artists, comedians who spoke, there's always been the body word. There's always been that. It hasn't always been like done in full, you know, view of everyone. But that's always been a part of it, an integral part of it. And I think part of, of comedians, et cetera, doing that is part of the protest, part of like, let me upset you, you know, let me say things that I know that are going to upset you. Now, some of time, th sometimes, of course, it's taken to perhaps uh, levels or, or, or to extremes that we don't appreciate. But I think that that is just as significant a part and just as an essential a part you know, of what, you know, the storytelling package is and the oral historian package is of, of what we do. I say this because I lived in Africa for a while and uh, places uh, back where they had never, ever even, you know, I mean, so far back that their exposure to cultures other than their own was like very small. I found the same thing, the braggadocio, because they'd whisper in the presence of women, okay? and not speak in the presence of children this, but all this was there. And I think the only thing that we see differently today is where it's being done and how it's being broadcast, you know, through the media and like there's no place sacred anymore. I'm, I, I think I probably have not been specific, 
And what I have reference to, Lerone Bennett made reference to it when he was receiving the Lifetime Achievement Award from the African American Black Arts Alliance. He talked about a B and H mm -hmm. culture. Mm -hmm. Defaming women for one thing. Mm -hmm. Calling women out of their name is not a part of our tradition. Not respecting the mothers and the sisters and the aunts is not a part of the tradition of the griot, the poet, the Well, I, I agree, but that's also... And that's the problem that I have with the comedy and with whatever el other art, a, right. a, a, a Look, quote, art has form. Its place. Uh, where does there, a B and H have its place? Well, there was uh, the, the, sig the signifying monkey when I, before I saw it cleaned up by Langston yes. Hughes and Anna Bontem in a book called Negro Folklore. Mm -hmm. That was totally vulgar. Mm -hmm. There was a thing about uh, shine. Shine. I mean, there was a I whole tradition of, of of that, but it had its place. You didn't say that in front of the children. You didn't say that in front of women. And it was there not was defaming your own people, and it was not defaming your own women. But, Sisters, but see, you have to get in this. But see, it wasn't, but here's what I'm saying. It wasn't, it wasn't looked at like that to say that. See, I think there's, there's a level where it's obvious comedy and obvious ridicule. Then there's another level where it is disrespect and defamation. And I think that's what I was saying when they say the extension to which they take it. Mm -hmm. Now understand the defamation of, of, of women folk Mm -hmm. is part and parcel of, uh, of uh, male rule society, which is particularly mm -hmm. Western, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, our tradition as people of, you know, African people, uh, we didn't put, we didn't have women in that same position as in patriarchal Western societies mm -hmm. where women are like permanently mm -hmm. second class mm -hmm. citizens, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. like that. So in that respect, and when I came up, uh, uh, signifying monkey was in the street, and uh, I was glad when, uh, um, Oscar Brown Jr. recorded one I could say that didn't have the cuss words in it because I love the story. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, it was not even thought of, and, I, and this is serious when I say this, it was not thought of as being demeaning the way it is now, even to say that. You but, know? but I think it's important on whatever level you entertain on that you teach and you reach young children. And so even with this barbershop thing, that it is not funny, that to take it out of content to, I'm saying, our leaders and the people we respect, that it is, is just as important for the comedians and anyone else on any level to carry on the level of respect that support black women and us as black people. I've heard uh, Richard Pryor has a routine that he uh, did about a junk and a junkie. Mm -hmm. And I've heard him do it on the stage full of cuss words. And I've heard him do it on television without any. Right. And uh, it was just as funny. I think I'm not talking about cuss words. I think I'm talking about ma name calling. Mm -hmm. And I'm specifically mm -hmm. talking about those names that have no reason except right. to right. defame right. Right. Well, and I, to denounce and to disrespect well, I think everybody, the recipient of the name. I think everybody, I, or at least I, agree with you to, to that degree. The, the only thing I'm saying is that I don't say that that is a part and parcel, the defamation of women, the disrespect, et cetera, is a part and parcel of what we're talking about in terms of our heritage and in terms of our tradition. And I said that because uh, perhaps I misunderstood the first thing you said, but you said something about that related to our tradition I'm and our heritage. That the comedians, the stand up comics mm -hmm. and the other comedians mm -hmm. are part of the lineage that began with the griot and came through the poet, through mm -hmm. the orator, and through others who right. were spokespersons, yeah. as it were, in the community. But, but I think... And now we have... Yeah, but I think we're... See, I think that we're just giving too much too much to that. You, you know wouldn't think that if you were a woman. No, yeah, well, perhaps I, not. I, no. Perhaps not. Perhaps I wouldn't. But I think, I still think we're giving too much to it because all of it is going to pass. The only thing that's going to remain is the true traditional thread. I remember when uh, Red Fox was considered dirty. Mm -hmm. I remember when Lenny Bruce mm -hmm. was considered dirty. Mm -hmm. And by today's standards, that would be mm -hmm. totally acceptable. But 
You know, there is vulgarity. There is offensive you know, language. You, there are offensive you just, images. You intentionally missing this point because you know perfectly <laughs> well I am not talking about obscenity, vulgarity, cuss words. You know, you know I know about Red Fox and Richard Pryor and all these other folks, and I'm not complaining about these things that they said that were not polite. You don't say in polite company, but I'm saying about this growing it seems to me increasing tendency on the part of some of our very young um, artists mm -hmm. to use women That's as right. the Scapegoat. the the scapegoats and women as the targets of mm -hmm. tremendous disrespect with all kinds of words that are even coined mm -hmm. skeezer mm -hmm. yeah. you know words that are even coined so that you can even take it to another level. But I'm saying that that is not in the tradition. That's, and I know that's, that's not in the so, tradition. So uh, She's asking why then has it become oh, so common? Why? Oh, money. 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 Right. White America wants right. to make money. Right. White America will take somebody with very little talent and make them a big star if they're willing to do that. They'll take somebody who has a lot of talent who is unwilling to do that and say we're not going to give you that. Mm -hmm. But white America's design, and I'm not talking, well anyway, let me just, I'll just keep on, I won't explain myself on, related to white America, I owe it nothing. But white America has a design to the continued destruction of us as a people. Mm -hmm. So who, there's a lot of people out there who, and, and there's many people who don't have any, any uh, morals, any character, any, I mean there's, as, there's always been from the beginning of time. Mm -hmm. Most societies have taken those people and relegated them to a small, unnoticed space. Mm -hmm. What white America has done is taken that group of people and made them media heroes. Mm -hmm. Okay, So I don't say that there's more of that. I'm just saying that now a poor kid sitting there looking at, well, who do I want to be like? Teju mm -hmm. or do I want to be like, um, um, mm -hmm. you know, like a rap star? Mm -hmm. Well, you want to be like a rap star. Well, how do I be like a rap star? Well, use a B word, the H word, you know, yeah, say demeaning things. But the things, artists but themselves right. have to take a stand and right. not be exploited to the point of making money at any cost. I agree, but they're not going to do that because they don't have character in the first place. It right. would require that they have character to do that. They don't have character in the first place. If they had enough character to take a stand, they'd have enough character not to do that. So you as storytellers have to teach and reach. Yes. We do. Right. The yes. young yes. people, you that's have what to we give do. them that's what we another do. option. Right. Right. That's what we do. You have to but show how cool it is listen, to be able to do this. You just described, you just described Oscar Brown Jr. And the effect that he had on my whole generation of street kids, mm -hmm. okay? Because our other possibility was shine and 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 stagger Lee, the dirty version, and uh, signifying monkey. Mm -hmm. When we heard Oscar Brown Jr. do that, we could actually sing it and bring those to it. So I, I totally agree with you. I think that's our objective. I think that's our obligation. And I think what we are is perhaps not a large enough number. But our effect is, to some degree, preserving what you're talking about and fighting to whatever degree we can against the thing that you're saying we should be standing against. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess I'll give up my campaign. Don't give up your campaign. <laughs> no, you can't give I, it I up. Think you're we're so, oh, we're soldiers well, in your, in your you troop. Know, right. First of all, in the English language, there's over a million words. Mm -hmm. And none of those are, are words that destroy, mm -hmm. that you can use to mm -hmm. communicate. Mm -hmm. What you got to look at is where's your source? Where do you stand on? What mm -hmm. foundation do you have? Mm -hmm. My wife, even though you know I'm not afraid of her most of the time, <laughs> carries this big gun because she's a police officer. Okay. And in in my worst mind, I would never think of disrespecting her mm -hmm. because I respect me. Mm -hmm. That's why I don't respect her. I disrespect her. Mm -hmm. But if you're disrespecting anyway, mm -hmm. that's just a natural thing to you. Mm -hmm. You think that's the way to do it. Mm -hmm. I don't do that mm -hmm. because it's something within me. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't fit right in my soul, in my spirit. Mm -hmm. So when I, even if I'm walking down the street and someone's calling somebody out of their name, that's not who I am. Mm -hmm. your mic. Oh, thanks. <laughs> so that, that's not, um, I, I find that if you, it, our society has lost morality in so many different ways, mm -hmm. our opportunity as storytellers is to bring that back, plant those seeds you know, that we can take it to another level. We don't have to be at that level. We could be at a whole different level. Well, there's a big budget 
for all this stuff that is negative to there us. There you go. I mean, right. That's, that's right. That just that's the key right there. Endless, endless money. Mm -hmm. And, right. of course, there are a whole bunch of kids who are willing to sell out, mm -hmm. you know, to, to get some of that mm -hmm. money. Mm -hmm. But there's an enormous... You can't get anything of nobility on BET, hardly. Mm -hmm. You can't get anything that speaks to uh, uh, tenderness. Mm -hmm. You can't do a song that's going to speak to, uh, to any kind of enrichment. Mm -hmm. They're not going to pay for that. Mm -hmm. not, there's no budget for that. They'll mm -hmm. tell you that's not commercial. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not bankable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they'll, they'll fund to no end it, on, on the basic networks, cable and uh, right. the regular networks, you know, cops, uh, uh, the Jerry Springer show. I mean, these are the ones that's banking the big money. Mm -hmm. And so the thing is, is the only, I say the only factor related to what you're saying, the only factor is the fact that white America funds it. If they would fund, if they would give equal funding to say s what we do, mm -hmm. there would be as many children wanting to do what we do, walking around trying to look like us, mm -hmm. as there are children caught up in the bling, you know, mm -hmm. trying to look like, you know, hip hoppers. I mean, there would be, mm -hmm. but I'm saying, particularly given the fact that Africans in America are on the lowest economic rung, for somebody who is po, the real thing that's important to them is, how do I get me some money? Mm -hmm. Now, the process they use to get that is secondary. OK. And then all these people. Now you find some people who was like, you know, once they get successful, they start to say, OK, now I'm going to turn to the church mm -hmm. and I can name 12 while I'm sitting here. Mm -hmm. OK. But before they got rich, mm -hmm. they wasn't interested in church. First, rich they wanted old. to make them some money. <laughs> <laughs> you, know? you know, I love this. Mm -hmm. I love this because, you know, I do a talk show, mm -hmm. but we keep talking about how the cakes look, mm -hmm. how the cakes smell how tall it is, how long it took to bake it. They need to taste the cake. All right. Mm -hmm. So I think, Andrea, I think I was going to ask you to just dislodge yourself from that microphone so that we can give our audience a little taste of this cake. And because uh, I could be here, you know, we could be here <laughs> all night mm -hmm. doing this. And we're going to obviously have to do this again. Yeah. But I think we need to just fade to black right now so we can come up on Andrea and the rest of us are just going to be cool. All right. Okay. Andrea. Andrea Fain, storytellers. I stand in awe of storytellers. Some will make you laugh and smile all day. Others will make you stop and uh, wipe a tear away. I stand in awe of storytellers. I listen and I've traveled to many places, some I haven't seen as yet. Witness glorious sunrises and golden sunsets. I stand in awe of storytellers. That day began like any other day. We were out playing and out of nowhere they came Kicking us and beating us and dragging us. They placed us in the bottom of a huge ship. One by one by one by one. Oh, the groans and the cries and the stench. And I never, ever saw my mother, my father, my sister, or my brother again. That one they call the overseer, he raised his hand. I saw the blood run muddy red. I was there 
when Brother Rabbit went running down that road. I saw, I saw the princess kiss the toad, ran from that purple giant with his long snotty nose. I stand in awe of storytellers. She whispered in her lover's ear. I felt his breath upon her neck, his fingers caressing gently. I stand in awe of storytellers, for they create magical moments, sing love songs, comfort those in pain. Bury the living and sometimes bring the dead back to life. There is power in the spoken word. There is power in the spoken word. Yes, I stand in awe of storytellers. Kucha Brownlee, I like the way you sing. In the upper room with my Jesus. I'm in the upper room talking with my Lord. And your God in the upper room. Ooh, I'm in the upper room. In the upper room, talking with my Lord. I was just remembering. Remembering a woman that was born right here in Chicago, not born in Chicago, but she lived in Chicago and she was, she was so important when I was coming up. They called her the queen of gospel, Mahalia Jackson. When she sang, you could feel it. People said she didn't just believe in God, she knew God. And she was the first gospel singer got famous. She was on television. Oh, when she would come on television, we would all run, tell our friends, Mahalia's on television. Come on, you got to see it. We'd call them up. Everybody sat there, spellbound, waiting to hear her sing, smiling. She made you feel so good. Now, when I was a little girl, we used to go back and forth to Memphis, Tennessee. Every year we went to Tennessee because that's where my people were from and we would go visit relatives. Sometimes we would drive and sometimes we would take the train. This one particular time, we were on our way back from Memphis and I was sitting there and I said, Mom, what are all those white people doing here? See, back then we had separate cars and so white people weren't usually on the same car as us. So I said, what are all those white people here? And she said, oh, Mahalia Jackson is sitting up there. I said, oh, Mahalia Jackson? Oh, can, can I go meet her? And she said, wait a minute, honey. Let, let it, let the crowd die down. So I waited, and I waited, and I waited. I fell asleep. But when I woke up, the car was dark, and there were no people standing in the aisle. So I said, Mom, can I go now? And she said, go ahead. And I walked up the aisle. I was so excited. I stood right next to her and looked at her. And, and she looked over at me and I said, I like the way you sing. And she said, thank you, honey. Oh, I floated back down the aisle. I was so excited. I was so excited. And my sisters, they were asleep. But when they woke up, I said, I met Mahalia Jackson. And they said, where? I said, she's sitting right up there. And we, they came. I was going to show them. I was going to introduce them. <laughs> but Mahalia got off at 63rd Street. And so they missed her. But I 
I met Mahalia Jackson in person. The first settler of Chicago was an African-American. What happened to his recognition? What happened to his recognition? What happened to his recognition? We're about to recognize him right now. He was an educated brother, a man of respect, a Haitian-born brother. From a violent past, his mother was killed and his home was burned. So DuSabo and his father turned to France, a land where he could be a man of means who loved equality. He heard of America across the sea. And he knew that it was called the land of opportunity. So he called his bold best friend. And they bought a ship set sail and the motion, the motion of the ocean, the rise, the fall, the chop, chop, chop of the water caused his friend to get sick. When they reached the shore, he could move no more. But to Sabu, you know he had to go and explore. He met a Choctaw who knew the land and together they devised a master plan. They bought supplies, built a boat, and down the Mississippi, they started a float. Along the way, they met Chief Pontiac, a Native American who admired the fact that DuSabo loved freedom too. So he decided to stay and learn the Indian ways, hunting, trapping, respect for the land. So DuSabo, just developed a new plan. He left the village, used his skills, and started trapping for trade. And before you knew it, DuSabo had it made. He signed on the dotted line, and old Fort Peoria, he could now call mine. DuSabo is the founder of Chicago. In 1772, with Deed in hand, he built a log cabin on Lake Michigan. It became the center of trade. Folks came from everywhere. As his fortune grew, you know, he had to share. He visited with the people of the land, the Potawatomi tribe. And pretty Kitahawa became his bride. DuSabo is the founder of Chicago. Just recognizing y'all, the Sabo worked hard and the fruit of his labor grew and grew. A large family house, a dairy, a bakery, a smokehouse, a workshop, and a horse-powered mill. The Sabo had a beautiful family. They all lived, respected. The Sabo he just loved peace and tranquility. And you know, he just took his own money from time to time and he bought enslaved people so he could set them free. Realizing his dream, he set forward to make better what we now know as the Windy City, Chicago. You better recognize, DeSabo is the founder of Chicago. DeSabo is the founder of Chicago. The first settler of Chicago, Jean Baptiste Point DeSabo. DeSabo is the founder of Chicago. DeSabo is the founder of Chicago, better recognize. Storyteller. Yes, my son. 
Is it true that the lion is king of the forest? Ah, yes, my son. That is very true. Ha! <laughs> if that's so true, then tell me, why is it, each time, when we hear stories of the hunter going into the forest, the hunter always wins? It will be that way, my son, until the lion starts telling stories. This is a piece by Sterling Brown. Well, you can't ever tell how far a frog could jump when you just see him planted on his big, broad rump. Know what a monkey's thinking by the working of his jaws. Now, you just can't figure. And I know, cause I, I had me a buddy. Soft as pie. Joe Meek, they called him, and they didn't lie. Now, the good book say, turn the other cheek. But that weren't no turning for my boy Joe Meek. He turned up all parts, and he begged you to spank. He pulled down his britches and supplied the plank. <laughs> now the worm that didn't turn was a rattlesnake to Joe. Wasn't scary, just Meek, sir, was made up so. Now it was <clears throat> late in August what they calls the dog days. Made even beetle hounds get bulldog ways. Would make a pet bunny chase a bad bloodhound, make a newborn baby slap his grandpappy down. Now the air, it was muggy and heavy with heat. The people all sizzled like frying meat. The ice house was heaven. The pavement was hell. Even Joe didn't feel so agreeable. Strolling down Claiborne on the wrong end of town, Joe saw two policemen knock a poor girl down. Now he didn't know her at all. Never saw her before, but it didn't make no difference to my old boy Joe. Walks up to the cops and very polite, asked them if they thought they had did just right. One hit him with a billy club above the left eye. One thugged him with a pistol and let him lie. When he woke up, found out what the cops had done. He went to the hawk shop, got himself a gun. Now he felt more out of sorts than ever before, so he went on a rampage, my old boy Joe. Shot his way to the station house and rushed right in and wasn't nothing but space where the cops had been. Tear gas made him laugh when they let it fly. Laughing gas made him hang his head and cry. He threw the hand grenades back with an out shoot drop and every time he threw, there was one less cop. The chief of police said, what kind of man is this? And he held up his shirt for an armistice. Stop gunning, black boy. We'll let you go. I thank you very kindly, said my old boy Joe. We promise you safety if you just leave us be. Joe say, that's agreeable, sir, by me. Now the sun had gone down. The air was cool. Joe stepped out on the pavement of fighting fool. Walked from the station house about a half a square when a cop behind a post let him have it fair. Put a bullet in his chest and one on his side, but Joe didn't lose his old shooting eye. He drew a cool bead on the cop's broad head. I returns you your favor. And the cop fell dead. Now the next to the last words that Joe was heard to speak is just what you'd expect from my boy Joe Meek. He spoke real polite to the folks standing by. Would you do me one favor before I die? I won't be round to bother you much longer, so would you bring me a drink of water before I go. Now the last words Joe was heard to say showed a different Joe talking in a different way. If my bullets weren't gone and my strength all spent, I'd send the chief something with a compliment and we'd race to hell and I'd best him there like I would have done here if he'd have played me. Fair. So, you can't never tell how fast a dog can run when you just see him sleeping in the sun. A lot of folks were weary as Rosa Parks sat down for one more crowded, dreary bus ride home across town. Yes, 
Rosa Parks was tired of being on her feet, so though the law required that she relinquish her seat because it was demanded by some man who was white, just like a tree that's planted, she sat with all her might. A brave determination reflected in the eyes of this respected matron as she refused to rise, despite the hostile fury, the white hot hate she saw, the threat of judge and jury upholding Jim Crow law. She sat as if commanded by destiny to stay. She sat as if God granted her some special powers that day. The police came and jailed her and charged her with a crime, and although her friends bailed her out in almost no time, by then, Negroes had been made mad. Heads had begun to shake, and they were saying they'd had about all they would take of bus seat segregation for which they paid full fare, the gross humiliation they all were made to bear. Next night, they had a meeting. The church was packed and jammed as they discussed bus seating and vowed that they'd be damned if they'd continue riding with Jim Crow. They would not. They ended up deciding to call a bus boycott. Now, this was in Montgomery, in Alabama, where white folk could be quite ornery and black folk best beware. But now, with Negroes showing no sign of old-time fear, they kept that boycott going for nearly about a year. Kept walking, walking, walking. Formed carpools, never balked. Despite the white folks squawking, they walked and walked and walked till they got satisfaction, got Jim Crow laws knocked down, and through their demonstration immortalized that town, Montgomery, Alabama. The demonstration made in that bus boycott drama, oh, what a change that made, led by heroic Rosa, so dignified and brave. Our children need to know the great leadership she gave, the heroes who have courage to leave distinctive marks, or sheroes we should cherish, like Sister Rosa Parks. <laughs> what once was warm began to chill as Father Time enforced his will until I wondered, am I still a ladies' man? <laughs> At first I tried to hide my loss, pretending I was still the boss with girls who'd never come across a ladies' man. But they moved with too swift a step. I needed patience more than pep to keep alive my fading rep, ladies' man. Don't get me wrong now, I'm not dead. My shoulders hold a damn good head, so joy has not completely fled a ladies' man. <laughs> but it can never be the same. The vigor has vanished from my game. For reminiscing, can you blame a ladies' man? I look back on the life I've led. What might my powers have got instead had I not shot so much in bed? A ladies' man. <laughs> What tricky trade might I have tried had I not laid preoccupied? But then who's ever satisfied a ladies' man? <laughs> the women I made frequently, each in her heart held secretly that she was really making me a ladies' man. A woman feels a man may guess that she conceals beneath her dress a trap in which she can possess a ladies' man. <laughs> she throws the bait, she shows the lure, there's no escaping, that's for sure. You're never really free when you're a ladies' man. Each fellow follows his own star, but take no appetite too far. That's sound advice in case you are a ladies' man. <laughs> but you call all this sour grapes, devote yourself to willing rapes, and never mind what all escapes a ladies' man. Oh, Youth must feel betrayed by age. I'm reading from a later page, and you can't hear me at your stage, a ladies' man. Therefore, my boy, enjoy your prime until your fateful date with time when you can claim no longer I'm a ladies' man. Hey, there's a beauty. You agree? Got quite a body, hasn't she? Well, sock it to her once for me, <laughs> a ladies' man.